Thanks for joining us, everyone. My name is Brian Elaine, and I'm here today with Paul Angoni, author of a new book titled Listen to Your Day, The Life-Changing Practice of Paying Attention, which just came out from Baker Books. Paul is one of the nation's most trusted and sought-after voices to young professionals, people going through change and transition, and those looking to live more intentional lives. The best-selling author of 101 Secrets for Your 20s, 101 Questions You Need to Ask in Your 20s, and 25 Lies 20-somethings Need to Stop Believing, Paul is a dynamic keynote speaker at universities, corporations, and churches nationwide. He's also the creator of allgrownup.com. That's grown with an A, not a W, which has been read by millions in 190 different countries and the All Grown Up podcast. Paul's an also an organizational consultant with a master's degree in organizational leadership who specializes in helping companies attract, retain, develop, and harness the best strengths of the millennial and Gen Z generations. He's been honored to work with amazing companies like Intel Security, Wells Fargo, and Aflac through speaking and uh, millennial influencer branding and awareness campaigns. He frequently contributes and has been featured in publish- publications such as Bloomberg, Chicago Tribune, Business Insider, Huffington Post, and many others. You can learn more at allgrownup.com. So that's A-L-L-G-R-O-A-N-U-P.com. So, Paul, it's so great to uh, to meet you, and um, congratulations on all your accomplishments. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's way too long of a bio. I don't I – mean, it's like <laughs> – I did. I, did I do all that? I don't know. I, 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 I took like, it from somewhere. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it must be true. You know, I think <laughs> I lived that. You know, it's but, on a uh, website somewhere. So it's gotta be true. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's been a wild ride uh, to get to this place, and uh, uh, you know, it's interesting all the different things that start coming your way when you start heading in one direction. So I feel like that's the kind of the life I've been living. So besides all that, what else would you like people to know about you? Well, I'm a, I'm a dad of four, you know, so that's a big part of my life too, with four kids under 12 years old. And, uh, and, and so I, you know, that's what I love about the life of being a writer and a speaker and kind of working for myself, being an entrepreneur really is, is that flexibility to, 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 to do life and work kind of all together, you know, and, and, and it makes it messy and sometimes it's hard and it's very busy, uh, but to bring kids along the ride, you know, and kind of do it all, all together with my wife as well, who's, uh, who's edited all my books wow. before they make it to a publisher. You know, my wife is the one editing them, uh, before anybody else sees them. <laughs> so it's been a, it's been a family, uh, family adventure for sure. Oh, well, that's very cool. Um, so before we get into the new book, can you talk a little bit about your previous books? Tell folks about, you know, what they are, how they came about. Yeah, you know, I think all of my books have really originated from the same place of feeling like I was failing miserably at mm. something mm. and then wanting to do something about it. Mm. And and that's why I had such a focus uh, on 20 somethings, you know, really just a very specific focus on life in your 20s with my books, 101 Secrets Your 20s, 101 Questions You Ask in Your 20s, and 25 Lies, 20 somethings You Stop Believing. <laughs> um, because it was such a hard decade of my life. Hmm. Uh, you know, I really felt like I was going to, you know, leave college with, the, with good grades, you know, get the right internship, right job, right house, right spouse, make a difference, make a lot of money, you know, all these expectations that are on us. And I think like most of us, you know, we realize pretty quickly that uh, the road is going to be much windier. Uh, there's going to be a lot of dead ends, a lot of rejection, failure, and, uh, and really learning that, you know, what I write about in 21 or 101 Secrets to Your 20s, that the possibility for greatness and embarrassment both exist in the same space. Uh, so it's really hard to do anything great in this world if you're not completely willing to embarrass yourself in the process. So I had to learn a lot of those principles. And uh, and then uh, and then as I would talk about it with other people, they'd be like, oh, man, Mike, this has been really hard for me, too. And where, where are the books for this? Uh, where's mm-hmm. the help? Uh, where's the syllabus now on how to navigate all of this? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's why I, I spent really 10 years uh, of my writing career, just writing books, really trying to speak to that time of life. And, and really it's for people going through transition and change, but it's just a unique season of transition and change where you're making all these major life decisions as kind of everything is swirling out from underneath you. Well, there was a, an important point in my life where I, finally realized that, you know, if I try something new and the worst thing that can happen is that it looks stupid and it doesn't work. 
and I said to myself, well, if that's the worst thing that can happen, who cares? Yeah. You know, but I had to kind of cross that threshold mentally because I, you know, obviously grown up in the same, you know, kind of mindset of, I didn't want to be embarrassed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and especially now with social media and, and for younger yeah. people too, you know, where they don't want to look, they want to look like they have it all together or, or create some uh, PR campaign almost, you know, we're almost like our own PR agents trying to craft this <laughs> message that our life is, is amazing and epic and successful. Um, and so it can have that feeling of, I don't want to look like I'm failing or I'm embarrassing myself, but, but I often tell everybody, you know, you know, what's the social media, uh, page that, that everybody looks at the most, you know, and it, everybody looks at this page the most on social media and it's their own, you know, <laughs> everybody looks at their own page the most, Yeah, you know, yeah. So, and, and nobody really cares that much about what you're doing. And it's almost freeing, you know, sometimes it can feel like, well, why don't people care more? And it's like, well, they just, they care about what they're doing more. Sure. And, and so it kind of frees you up. If <laughs> once you kind of grapple with that, you're like, you know, nobody really cares that much. <laughs> you know, I might have my mom call me and worried and say, you know, I'm worried you're going to be living in a box under a bridge, you know, but other than <laughs> that, you know, you know, I can kind of, I can take those risks, you know, strategic risks, you know, and that's why I say, especially when you're younger, you know, the biggest risk you can take is, is not taking any risks at all mm-hmm. uh, because you have kind of built in flexibility. You have more time. You, you don't true. have maybe the house or the three kids and not that you can't take the risk. Then it's just going to be a little bit more of a calculated risk uh, versus if you have that more of that flexibility. It's funny because like you said, it, it, there's a stage in your life when it's easier to take risk. Right. And then you kind of get this stage of your life where it's a little bit tougher. But then again, at least I found when I get to this stage, it's yeah. easier again. Yeah. You know, which again, I wouldn't have predicted that, but yeah, it's, it's true. So anyway, um, so let's get to the new book. I loved this title when I heard this. Listen to your day, the life changing practice of paying attention. Oh my gosh. So what motivated you <laughs> to write that? Sa- same motivation, feeling like I was really failing and struggling at uh, focus at losing focus at my inability to really pay attention to what I said was important, Hmm. you know, and I would say, you know, well, of course my family is the most important or my, you know, my work as an author or, you know, uh, my faith is the most important. And yet if you're looking at my time spent, uh, and what I'm really focusing my choice attention to, Hmm. it is not to these things. Hmm. You know, and, and really it's mostly to my phone. You know, if you look at just the time breakout on my day, you know, my phone is telling me I'm spending four, five, six hours a day staring at it. Um, and would I say my phone is the most important part of my life? Uh, no, it's not. So, and, and then I was just really struggling at even writing, at, at reading a book. Hmm. You know, I just felt hmm. like I was losing that ability hmm. because my, 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 my brain and, and my habits we're really being rewired. And, and so I, I just felt like, man, I got to do something about this. I got to research about mm-hmm. this. I got to mm-hmm. write about this. I got to think about this. And really, I got to pay attention to this problem. Uh, and, and I think it's such an important topic because I really think there's a, a battle going on for our attention. You know, your attention is, is money. Your, your time is money um, more so than ever. You know, we're really in a currency of attention. And if, if something has your attention, they can make money off of that. I was going to ask you like, about that, that phrase, because uh, I, yeah. I saw that, you know, you talk about that in your book. I mean, the currency of attention. Yeah. And that's really. It, it's it's oh. built into the phrase, you know, yeah. pay, pay attention. You know, we really have that <laughs> transactional, that that transactional uh, <laughs> effect taking place. And uh, so you really are, you are making uh, investments with your attention, you were paying your time. And, uh, and it's, and it's like most of us are, you know, we're walking out the front door and we just have twenties in our pocket and we're just throwing them around, you know, whoever wants one, just take it. You know, I don't really know just as long as it distracts me for five minutes here, take, take my money, you know, and that's kind of how we are interacting with our attention mm-hmm. online. Um, and it's also, you know, what am I in debt to with my attention? So, so not only what am I investing in, but also what am I in debt to mm. with my attention? What am I spending my choice attention? Because really I'm indebted to that. 
And, and whatever we're focusing on, we're also becoming. You know, that that's really what is infiltrating our minds, our hearts. That's what we are focused on throughout the day. That's making our decisions for us. And so it's like, do I want to be in debt to the things that I'm spending my most uh, most of my time paying attention to? <laughs> and so I think these are, you know, these are important questions for all of us to ask of, am I living an intentional life with, with attention? You know, we talk about self-discipline a lot in, in many categories. And I think attention is really one of those categories. You know, it's, it's, it's a discipline. It's a habit of, I need to build a habit of intentional attention. And where am I placing that? Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to ask you, what's an important question for me, and that is about Frederick Buechner. Um, and for those of people who are not familiar with Frederick Buechner, one of the titles of one of his books was listening to your life, right? And one of his you know, quotes that I'm going to do a poor job of par paraphrasing was basically he said something along the lines, if there's one thing that you should listen to all the stuff I've been written, it's pay attention. <laughs> uh, so again, when I, when I saw the title of your book, I thought, oh my yeah. gosh, you know, this guy's got it. You know, he's really, um, you know, today's version of uh, Frederick Buechner. I thought, well, oh, I, I got to meet Paul. <laughs> well, I wish I would have uh, found that quote or, I, you know, I haven't even read that book. I've read Frederick Buechner's work and I've loved, and we were talking before, I've, uh, it was his work. It was some of the most uh, transformational for me, hmm. uh, especially the book uh, Telling the Truth, yeah, which is the, the gospel's, uh, yeah. you know, comedy, fairy tale. Uh, what's the other one? Comedy, fairy tale, comedy, and, tragedy, and fairy tale. tragedy and fairy tale. There you yeah. go. Uh, which for me, when I was going through a kind of a crisis of faith and really kind of struggling with that question in my twenties, again, another aspect of life that I think we wrestle with a lot. Um, that was a really important one for me, uh, because I felt like, uh, it was, it was just the, the honesty and the beauty and the, and the hard stuff and the, and the funny stuff and just getting that all there and telling the truth. Um, I was really struggling with feeling like I, I felt I was feeling at that time, like your church is really not telling the truth to mm -hmm. me. It's really not grappling with all aspects of the gospel, you know, from a faith perspective. So that's why I really appreciated that. I actually put that, I wrote a list called, I think it was like 27 books every 20 something mm -hmm. should read. Mm -hmm. And I put that book on there and I, and I didn't have a ton. There's not a ton of faith oriented books on that list. It's a mix of all kinds of books. But that was one that I, I was like, I, I think every everybody and especially 20 something should read. So, yeah, yeah. Um, when we were um, when I was basically leading the Frederick Buechner Center, um, we would donate copies of some of his books to seminaries each year. Hmm. And, you know, I'd give them here's a series of different books, which one a lot of them would pick, you know, telling the truth hmm. um, just because they, they believed that that would really resonate with their students. And, uh, you know, his analogies that he puts into that book are really powerful. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's beautiful. I mean, it's really poetic. I mean, it's just such a mixture. You know, it's not your typical self-help Christian book. You know, no, it's really no, more, not it's at really all. more of a. <laughs> it's really more of a story and a poem and, and just everything that he's kind of weaving in there. It's, it's a beautiful book. So, so I've, I've, I've interacted with Frederick Beekner or whoever's managing his Twitter account. It could have been you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I ran I've it for several years. I don't, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't now, but I did for several years. <laughs> you, you, we might've been interacting to uh, Frederick Beekner's page and not knowing it. So, <laughs> so um, I'd like to read from one of the endorsements for your book. Um, this is from Jonathan Pakluda. I'm not sure if I'm, pronouncing that correctly, but he's a yeah. best-selling author and host of uh, Becoming Something podcast and a lead pastor at a church. He says, listen to your day is going to help you clean your thinking and find a piece that you didn't know was possible. Paul Angoni addresses one of the biggest problems of our day. If you have a smartphone in your pocket, you would be, <clears throat> you would be smart to read this book again and again. So can you talk a little bit more about what he's referring to as the biggest problem of our day. Yeah. You know, it's, it really is that we, I think we're losing the battle for our attention and, 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 and in that, I think we're living such noisy, distracted lives, you know, and, 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 and we feel like something's missing and yet we don't know quite how to change things or quite how to get back on track to, you know, I don't feel like I'm really doing what I want to do with my life or I feel really anxious and fragmented. I don't feel like I'm living kind of this whole life 
from a place of peace and joy and rest, uh, I've kind of I've kind of lost that rootedness. And, uh, and and so that's why I, I wrote this book. Listen to your day. You know, it, it's it's kind of twofold. It's it's one. You know, what are the distractions that are keeping us from really paying attention to our day? And I, so I talk about you know obviously the the smartphone uh, and how that's become really our reflex response. So any mo- any kind of down moment, any bored moment, uncomfortable moment, any any a red light, a line, or whatever it is. I'm going to instantly, that's my, now that's my reflex response where I'm going to pull this out and I'm going to look at anything, something, just anything to fill that void, that time, Mm -hmm. that space. Um, So it's, it's all the distractions with that. But then on the flip side, it's then what are you, you know, what are you taking in through all these platforms and media, all the noise, all the messages that's coming at you, but then also what are you missing out of? Hmm. When you when you're not listening to your day, when you're not listening to the revelation and the insight, uh, the ideas, you know, the things that are coming at us every day that we have to be a, we have to be consciously aware of. You know, we have to be paying attention to these for us to hear and see them. And so that's kind of where the book it's kind of in those two two ways, you know, trying to get away from the distractions. How do we do that? And then how do we start being more intentional? with the ways that we're paying attention throughout our day. Mm -hmm. So um, in the book, you talk about some of the instances where you, you know, kind of like were influenced by paying attention. Um, What were some of those specifics? Yeah. I mean, I talk about, you know, even different habits that I've been, been built, been building since I've been writing the book, you know, so I, so now I do a 45 minute walk slash hike Hmm. during my work day, you know, that's scheduled in, I do that uh, no matter what, uh, you know, unless something crazy comes up. Uh, and so that is a time where I don't listen to anything. I'm not listening to a podcast or music. Uh, I'm just taking that walk, you know, and there's tons of psychological studies that are showing that if you go out in nature and walk for 30 minutes, that's going to do more for your mental health, emotional <laughs> health. You know, it's going to, it lessens exi- anxiety. Uh, it, it helps with depression. It helps with all these different things. Um, also for me, it's one of the most productive 45 minutes of my day. Hmm. Uh, It really is because I'm getting, you know, I I often say aha moments, they don't happen by accident. You know, aha moments don't happen by accident. They happen in those spaces in our day where we are at peace or at rest or quiet. You know, that's why people often say I get my best ideas in the shower. Yeah. Yeah. It's this relaxing time where you're not filled with noise and your mind is subconsciously working on solving problems. Um, you know, from a faith perspective, you know, that might be the time where you're able to hear what the Lord has been trying to tell you all day, you know, but finally you've quieted down enough to be able to hear that message. And, uh, and so for me, when I take that hike, that's when I'm doing my best writing, you know, I'm getting my best ideas when I'm out walking, Hmm. you know, so it's really, I'm, I'm living the life of a writer, it, you know, being, especially being a writer, it's more of a, a lifestyle. It's something you live by just actively paying attention and protecting those spaces to do so versus I'm just going to be sit at a computer. I'm going to grind out two hours worth of stuff, whatever it is, you know, no, it's, it's more, I do my best writing in those, in those moments that I've kind of set out and protected hmm. uh, to hmm. be able to have that process take place. <clears throat> Back in my business life, I used to take a lot of international flights. Hmm. Where, you know, it was basically hours on end when you were disconnected. Uh, yeah. So the days before, you know, Wi-Fi on the plane and things like that. Sure. And I found the same kind of thing. You know, it, it once you, I got that separated for, in that case, you know, that long of a time. Mm-hmm. Um, it really caused me to, you know, generate some of the best thinking that I had during those years. So, yeah, it's kind of it, it, an interesting. Exactly. Time. You know, and we're, we're losing that, you know, and we're losing that ability and that those spaces, uh, because it's hard for those ideas to break through so much, so much noise and distraction. Um, and so we really have to be intentional about building some of those spaces into our life. And it doesn't have to be monumental. It doesn't have to be an hour hike. Mm-hmm. It could just be five minutes in your car. It could be choosing to take a bath. It could be gardening out in the backyard. You know, these moments, things that you enjoy working with your hands, you know, doing some kind of action in a place that you love, uh, is good for your emotional, spiritual, physical, mental health. So that's great. 
but it's also just a great time of, of what psychologists call the incubation effect, where you know you have these kind of problems and things that you're trying to solve, and when you move away from it and you do something that you enjoy, they call it the incubation effect, where then you, now you're mm -hmm. you're finding the answers to that problem that you couldn't <laughs> figure out when you were sitting at the in the yeah. meeting or at yeah. your computer. Yeah, isn't that crazy how our minds work that way? So you've also written about what you define as obsessive comparison disorder and obsessive connection disorder. Um, what, what are those? Yeah, that's, um, you know, I'm not trying, trying to make a light of obsessive compulsive disorder, but, but it, it really is trying to point to, I think, how severe the issue is getting in, in the sense of really our, our social media and, and smartphone addictions. You know, and, you know, if I ask somebody, you know, you know, who spends 30 minutes on Instagram or Facebook, 45 minutes, you know, kind of the time gets away from you. You're just scrolling uh, infinitely, just looking at stuff, you know, who, who leaves that experience and says to themselves, you know, that was a great use of my time. Like, <laughs> like, I feel so much better about my life. Like, I feel confident. I feel secure, feel ready to tackle my problems. Um you know, I don't think many people leave that experience feeling that way. And, and so that's why I kind of, I kind of landed on this obsessive comparison and obsessive connection disorder in the sense that we're, we're obsessively connecting to something through our phone, mm -hmm. which in turn is actually leaving us very disconnected from the lives that we're living in our day to day <laughs> from our, you know, meaningful relationships that we're having. You know, we're spending five times connecting with everybody around the world through social media. And then we might spend, you know, three minutes in passing with our spouse as we're running around, you know, and, and, and barely talking. You know, so I think we've really, uh, it's becoming very disaligned with how much time we're doing that. And then, and then the amount of comparison taking place. Uh, you know, we've always compared ourselves to others. You know, used to compare yourself to the, you know, the Jones next door or whatever, who has the bigger house, who has the bigger car, you know, whatever it might be. Well, now we have a global comparison yeah. game yeah. that that's instantaneous. Yeah. Um, you know, I often say you, you used to have to go to your 10 or 20 year reunion to look everybody up and down to see, okay, who's doing better than whom, you know, who's, who's <laughs> successful, but, but you just had to fake it for one night, you know, <laughs> lose some weight, get a toupee, like rent the BMW, like whatever it took. <laughs> to trick everybody, right? I'm, I'm doing amazing. And then you could go back to your real life the next day because nobody would know. Uh, now we're trying to pull off that same phenomenon with every post, with everything we're sharing. Uh, and it's just this constant comparison trap that's taking place, this obsessive comparison, um, which then is isolating us. And it's really blocking true connection because that, it seems like everybody's doing better than me so I don't want to share about my struggles. I don't want to share about my problems. I don't want to have an open conversation with that friend because I don't want to look like the one failure out of the group, you know? And so it's becoming a very isolating, lonely generation mm -hmm. that is connected globally. So it's a strange paradox taking place. So let's say that, you know, a person's been successful in paying attention. What then do you have in terms of recommendations for what you do about it? Yeah, you know, and, and that's the beauty of, you know, really the book, you know, my new book, Listen to Your Day, is that is that one, it's meant to be written in, you know, it's kind of how it's mm -hmm. a it's part mm -hmm. workbook, you know, so it's not about me trying to give somebody the answers. I'm just trying to give somebody a framework uh, and a lens and practices and habits so that they can start finding the answers for themselves. Um, and so even at the, the tail end of the book, uh, I talk about different what I call mindset models that people can practice uh, for different ways of paying attention to their day. Mm. And then they can write all their ideas, revelation, what they're seeing. You know, I'm really guiding them through a process mm. of, okay, you know, so like, you know, very fitting to this podcast, I have the writer's mindset model, you know, so how do you think like a writer? You know, and I kind of lay that out here. Here's what a writer is doing. Here's what a writing writer is paying attention to today. I want you to think like a writer and then I want you to write it all down. You know, when you get that insight, when you get that idea, uh, I want you to make note of it right away uh, in the book. And I think you'll be amazed at then what you find, what you see, what you're you're actually hearing 
throughout the day, uh, but maybe you just didn't take that time to, to write it down. Um, or you thought, you know, I'll, I'll remember this later. Um, this is such a great idea. Of course, I'll remember it, you know, when I have time to write it down. And then it's like, well, you know, you forget it because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you didn't take that time. So I have these different, you know, I have the entrepreneurial mindset model, investigator, consultant, farmer, mm -hmm. monk, you know, <laughs> just again, these different ways of, you know, these people look at their day through a different lens. So how do we bring and incorporate some of those elements? It's almost like role playing so that you can then practice different mm -hmm. ways. And, and you, and I think you'll all be amazed at then what you start seeing, what you start pulling out from your day. You're like, wow, I can't believe all this stuff was here all the time. You know, I just wasn't seeing it. I wasn't paying attention to it. Excellent. Excellent. So um, what, is there anything else about the book that you'd like people to know about? Um, you know, I just think this is an important conversation worth paying attention to, you know, it's funny that I'm trying to <laughs> raise my hand and say, Hey, pay attention to this, you know, as I'm saying, you know, everybody's clamoring for your attention. <laughs> um, but I think we really do need to reclaim, uh, our attention, you know, and I think I, I can't think of a, a much, a much more important, uh, topic and, and something that we need to start talking about because it's really going to, um, it's just going to halt so many things in your life, you, you, your progress into your calling, your purpose, your relationships, so much of it is dictated by what you're paying attention to. And, uh, and the most successful and fulfilled people, I believe in this world, have really built the habit and practice of paying attention to what's important to them. They have really learned how to narrow their focus. They're not looking at everything and being distracted by all these different things. You know, experts, mm -hmm. people that are really thriving, have just really built that ability to narrow their focus on things that are truly important to them. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to take those action steps and they want to keep doing something about that um, because it's meaningful and it's rich. And it builds that compounding interest. You know, again, as we pay attention, it's building the compounding interest where now you're building that investment of I'm paying attention to this thing and now I'm growing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think it's such an important conversation that's only going to be more uh, dire and difficult, you know, as technology gets more progressive and more advanced, more invasive, you know, right now this phone is just in our pocket, you know, but as we progress to now it's on our, you know, our skin, we're wearing it as a watch. Now it's glasses. Now it's my windshield. Uh, now it's meta, you know, it's this whole digital world, you know, as, as it gets more and more advanced, you know, it's going to be harder and harder to really reclaim our attention. So I think it's such an important topic for all of us to pay attention to. I've told people for a few years now that we're going to have chips inside our brains before we know it. <laughs> Probably to you have know, more an advanced experience. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be connected to the internet medically. Yeah. Which, you know, the good news and bad news, right? I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, you know, people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that, but I thought I, and the, the medical industry is already driving us there for monitoring purposes, mm. right? You know, mm -hmm. we, how many people have pacemakers already? Yeah, sure. We're going on forever. So, you know, and now with Fitbit and, and things like that, it's getting more into monitoring. Well, you know, anyway, it'll go further, but we'll see how yeah, that plays out. Exactly. So um, looking forward, are there any other future books or projects that you're able to talk about at this point? Sure. Well, we were talking about before we, the call, you know, I have a fiction book that, that mm -hmm. I've written. You know, I, I'm mainly known as a nonfiction author, uh, but I had this dream 10 years ago uh, and I woke up in the middle of the night had never had this happen before. And I literally just got up and wrote down three pages. Wow. It was like I had this download of this whole, the whole arc of a story of the character, the name, the friends. I mean, it was, it was wild. And so, uh, but I never felt like I could get to that book. You know, I was always trying to grow other things, but a few summers ago I had time and I, I wrote this book down uh, <laughs> and it's called Fanny. That's the name. And Fanny huh. is a, is a, is a high school boy. And, and that's his nickname he's been given his whole life. And so he's kind of this outcast. Um, he's overweight. Uh, he's really kind of seen as, you know, no, no one's paying attention to Fanny. But he loves opera music. And his, his hero is Pavarotti. Uh, but he's too afraid to sing in public. You know, so he's got this amazing voice. Uh, but he can't let it out because he's always kind of believed this, this lie that he's a mistake. That wow. he's just... 
you know, he, the moment he was born, uh, he was just an accident. So it's really a, a story about him coming to terms with the, really with that feeling of, you know, I, I have a purpose, you know, I have an identity, I have a real name, you know, his real name is Francis. And what does that mean? You know? And so, um, and then can he get up on stage? You know, and that's what it's building towards. Huh. Uh, wow. can, can he get up on stage? And so, uh, I, I, it's, I, I love the fiction side of things because you're able to bring in truth through a different way, you know, through exactly. an emotional way, you know, and it was a really fun, fun way to do as a nonfiction author to get in, in immersed in fiction where you're really, your story is coming to life, you know, and you're just kind of trying to catch up to it, you know, as it, as it moves in front of you. And uh, so hopefully someday that, that book or that movie or both <laughs> will be available to the masses. That's what I'm trying to, that'll be my next step is figuring out where, to, where, where does that go? Well, we'll look forward to that. I mean, that's <laughs> very, very intriguing and interesting. So, well, Paul, thanks so much for joining us and for all the work that you've done. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, again, the title is Listen to Your Day, The Life-Changing Practice of Paying Attention. And you can learn more at allgrownup.com, A-L-L-G-R-O-A-N-U-P.com. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks, Brian.